third hand up. So it's the second part of the device physics light series. Okay, so uh, now the next topic we have is the MOSFETs and MOS transistors and MOS transistors. So far we've talked about the bipolar transistors, so now we'll start talking about the MOS transistors. And to understand the MOS transistors, one of the things we have to understand first, and it's very essential to the behavior of the MOS transistor, is the MOS capacitor. So we'll start with the MOS capacitor. Now, MOS or MOS uh, stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor. And we'll see how it's relevant to what we discussed. So the basic MOS capacitor structure is a very simple structure. So what you have, you have a metal or a conductor in, more, in, in general. Actually, most of, nowadays, most of the conductors are not made out of metal. In fact, they're made out of highly doped polysilicon. But for historical reasons and um, where it's basically we calling these MOS capacitors. So we have a conductor here, or well, let's call it a metal. And then we have a semi a, a, um, an insulator and Again, since many times it's made out of silicon dioxide, we call it oxide, but it's really an insulator. It could be made out of nitride or other kinds of things. So this is an insulator layer. And then underneath, you have a piece of semiconductor. Let's say in this case it's an n pipe, for our example. Piece of semiconductor. Okay? Now you have these three terminals, and let's say this is, a, this is ground. your reference potential. And now you can apply a voltage that's called a VG for gate to this terminal. Did you get are we short of handouts? Yes. Yeah. How many more do we need? It's one. Sorry. So and then we have an insulator here. This is the insulator. Separating these two. Now what happens if I apply a positive voltage to the gate? And this is an n type semiconductor. What do you expect to happen? Intuitively. Capacitor. Capacitor is what electrons to line up right under the insulator. Right. So what happens is that you have there, there's, there's a lot of electrons here, right? It's an n type semiconductor. You have a lot of free electrons. You attract electrons, and the electrons will start um, accumulating close to the surface. And you will have positive charge on this side. On the same side. But it could be at the edge of the metal. Because this is a or thin conductor. If it's a good conductor, it will be all right next to the insulator, right? So you have a kind of a capacitive structure. You have a distribution of charge on this side and a positive charge on the other side. Now, what if I kind of, let's talk about this qualitatively first and then we'll talk about it a little bit more quantitatively. What if I apply negative voltages to the gate? What do I do? Well, if I apply zero voltage, for presumably I don't have much here, but then beyond that, if I apply negative voltage, what do I do? I have to have charge in trap, right? Go. Uh, if you apply negative voltage, then you um, repel. Yeah, repel electrons. Right, exactly. So I start repelling electrons and effectively form a depletion region at the surface. Because this is an n type semiconductor, so I have positively charged ions left behind. They're, they're donors, right? So when, when, they, when you repel them, and then effectively you get a positive charge from the depletion region, you have the depletion region here, and then you will have plus uh, negative charge on the surface of the conductor to balance that. Now, if I make this voltage even larger, what happens? Yeah, so initially, I will increase the width of the depletion region, right? But beyond that, it's not very clear what happens. I mean, from this picture, we can't tell. I mean, a couple of things could happen. One thing is that you keep extending the width of the depletion region, which is compensated choice, right? But effectively, that doesn't happen. At some point, it stops, and something else happens, which we'll see why that happens in a second. 
that is effectively called, it's called inversion. And in effect, what you do, you start attracting holes. There are holes here, too. There are not a whole lot of them, but there are holes, right? Because the product of these two has to, the n and p has to be constant. n times p was n i squared. So you have holes, and you start attracting holes, and the holes start concentrating at the edge. So you will have a layer of holes on the surface, as opposed to extending your depletion region even farther. And it's not clear why this happens. So any of these two could, could happen. From the simple picture that I've shown here, it's not clear why one or the other should happen. So let's look at the bad energy band diagram and see why things happen the way they do. So we'll go through these different modes of operation of this transistor in the next few uh, minutes. And we'll see how they are. But before we do that, we have to understand how we draw an energy band diagram of these things. So we have three different kinds of material. We have the metal, or the conductor medium, which is called the metal. And the way we model the metal in the energy band diagram is that we have a Fermi level below which all the energy state, all then there are a lot of electrons, okay, and above which you have, of course, the distribution. So you have a Fermi level here, and to get the free electron from inside the metal to the outside core, you still have to spend a certain amount of energy, right? The electrons are bounded to the crystal lattice, although they can move within the valence band, of, uh, within the conduction band in this case, of the metal. It doesn't mean that they are free electrons. You remember like the energy levels you had in the hydrogen atom. They were negative energy levels. To get it to zero energy level and the positive one, you have to spend a certain amount of energy. So that's the energy you have to spend to get it to the vacuum energy level. Whereas if you release an electron. But what is that called, by the way? What is the energy you need? What is, what is the name of the energy you need to release an electron from inside the material, let's say a metal? Ionization. Uh, not a, well, we call it work function. Ionization, well, it's different because you are assuming that it's some sort of gas or something. This is a metal. So it's called the work function, right? They're like the, uh, when you talk about photoelectric effect and all those things, you talk about work. Let me show you the capital B for, for the metal. Capital B M. So this is the energy you need to have, you need to apply. So you need, for instance, you need a photon with at least this much energy to release an electron. A real free electron outside. So that's, the, that's what you have on the side. Now, how about, the, what is it, what is it, what's an insulator? So you have silicon dioxide. How, how do you represent that? What was an insulator? We talked about this when we were talking about the semiconductor devices, right? Semiconductor business. That's a large. It has a large band gap, right? So it's a, something that has a large band gap. So this is your EG, and so this is your valence band, this is your conduction band. And does this mean that if something is in the conduction band, it's a free electron? If it's an electron, it's in the conduction band, it's free? Not necessarily, right? It's free to move in within the conduction band, but it's not a free electron per se. So to free it, you need some additional energy. Free. And that energy is often referred to, it's shown with chi, so let's say chi of i for insulator, and that's called the electron affinity. So that's the extra energy you need to get energy released from the edge of the conduction band to, to vacuum free, free space. Okay? Now the same thing, you can say the same thing for the semiconductor. Now how about the semiconductor? Now, this is an n-type semiconductor. So we have the conduction band and valence band here. And we expect the uh, Fermi level to be above the EI. So this is the intrinsic energy level. And for, since it's an n-type material, we expect it to be somewhere here. So this is the Fermi energy. And again, for semiconductor, you can also define some sort of electron affinity by psi. Now, if I ask you, what is, the fer what is the work function of the semiconductor? What would you tell me? Work function is the energy I need, the average energy I need to release an electron. Uh, no, to, to vacuum, right? So I need to have enough energy to get it from. What is the average energy of an electron? What is it? Let's put it this way. What, what, is, what is the definition of EF? EF is the energy level at which half you have a problem to one half of finding an electron. Right? By definition. So, it's a, for to find the average energy, I need to find how much energy I need to get the electron released from here to there. So if I were to define a work function for the semiconductor, 
it would be this energy difference, EC minus EF, plus the electron affinity. Right? I need this much energy. Okay. So I have these, so this is the center. Now, we push this, we pull this down, what 
happens? We lower this potential. So where does the potential drop? Well, part of it drops across this K dog side, right? This is a capacitor that will have electric field inside uh, across it. So there will be a potential difference. And part of it will cross inside the semiconductor. So what happens is this. So hold down here, like this much. So this starts bending. Now, part of my potential drop falls across the, like, uh, the uh, insulator, and another part of it has to fall across the uh, semiconductor. So I start like this, and EF is also bent. I'm sorry, EI is bent. With EF bent, should the EF bend? EF is the energy level for the distribution. So now there's no net flow of current in here, right? There is no charge transfer inside the semiconductor because there's no way for net charge transfer. So EF, Fermi energy is constant across the whole semiconductor. So that remains constant, but everything else is bent. And the, how about the vacuum energy? The vacuum energy has to track these because this has to be constant, so it drops here and then it goes flat. So this has to be constant, this has to be pi naught, pi i, this has to be pi s, and all the points. So this tracks the conduction band. And here it's constant, so it's basically Pn. So that's, that's what the picture looks like. Now, let's look at the semiconductor and see what happens. What does, what does this energy band gap tell me about energy band now you're telling me about the distribution of carriers, the electrons are What can I say? Well, do I, well, here I have a certain number of electrons at home. It's, it's an n-type. How can I tell it's an n-type by looking at this? Yeah, EF is above EI, right? And we know N, the distribution of the density of electrons, is NI E to EF minus EI over KT. So here, first of all, I know it's n-type, as we just well, we said from the beginning, since E n is over E r. But now, what can I say about the density of electrons here at the edge? Do I have more electrons than I have in the bulk, or less? Do I have more or fewer? I have more, right? Because now E f minus E i is greater here. And therefore, n is greater. That means that I'm accumul accumulating electrons at the surface. If I look at my charge distribution across this, I have a negative distribution of charge minus Q, which is balanced by a positive distribution of charge at the surface of the semiconductor, uh, surface of the conductor. There are plenty of electrons there. Or it's a plenty of free charge, so you can basically get as much charge as you want at the surface. That's the definition of a metal or a semiconductor or a conductor. So this area, of course, has to be equal to that, so it doesn't look like it. Right? For charge with charge. So you can see it's consistent with the band diagram, energy band diagram. So I'm lowering the potential, uh, I'm increasing the potential here, basically lowering this energy level which means that I'm pulling, pushing this down because this energy difference has to be constant, right? Because this, this height is fixed. It's chi s minus chi i. It's just the property of the semiconductor. It comes from the basic properties of the semiconductor and the insulator. So that has to be fixed. So when this side is pushed push, push down, this side is pushed down, and therefore, since EF has to be constant, this, this difference is larger, so it becomes more and more n-type at the surface. This mode of operation is called accumulation. For obvious reasons, you're accumulating charge in the surface. Okay, fine. Now let's go and apply a negative potential to the gate. If I apply a negative potential to the gate, something else. So now I'm in fact pushing this up beyond the flat left, right? So I'm doing the opposite. That we draw everything. And 
then this has to be fixed. And then I have to square my number for the map. And then the vacuum energy looks like this. So this is fixed. Chi F. This is fixed. This is fixed. This is chi I. And this is fixed. B F. Now what happened? What does this tell me? Again, it's the difference between the EI and the EF levels that determine how many electrons I have. So what does it tell me about the surface? It tells me that I have much fewer electrons, right? It's an exponential dependence. So now here, I have much fewer electrons. So in effect, that tells me that I have depleted the surface of charge. So here, what I have, I have a positive charge here, and then at some point it decays very quickly. It's an exponential decay. It can't grow beyond, the net charge cannot grow beyond the NA, I'm sorry, ND level, the dopant level. So those are the ionized charges. And on this side, we have negative charge to compensate. And this drops very quickly, so sometimes we just show it as a kind of an abrupt depletion region. It's an exponential dependence, right? So I have a depletion region. And that's consistent with what we thought would happen. Now, that's called the depletion rule of operation. Now, what happens if I apply even a larger negative, well, it's more negative potential to the gate? What happens? So, what does that correspond to? We just have to push this up higher, right? So, when I push this higher, let's see what happens with energy background. So, I push this higher.
you know what, it's not a voltage here, to attract the bottom. They have to come from somewhere. Uh, ionized, kind of air, right? thermal generation, right? They have to, in the bulk, you are constantly generating electron hole pairs because of the thermal energy. The thermal energy is constantly generating, or releasing holes, uh, electron from the conduction band, from the valence band to the conduction band, creating a hole of elect a pair of electron holes. Now, now if I have something like this, these holes have a tendency to end up here because they, as soon as they get here, the electric field will absorb them and bring them here. So they accumulate them. Now, you expect this process to be a fast process or a slow process? It's a very slow process, right? Because they have to be generated over time. There's a finite number of them generated at any point in time. So when you start doing this, this will be you expect this to be a slow process. And the way you see this is interesting. Now, if you actually go and in the lab, make a mass capacitor analysis, and start measuring the capacitance. Versus voltage. So this is what you will see. So this is the voltage V gate. And at very large voltages, at very large positive voltages, what do you see? What do you expect to see for the capacitance? So this is, let's say, C capacitance. What do you expect to see? You see, at that point, what mode of operation are you in? You're in accumulation, right? From positive voltage, you attract a lot of electrons from the box. So you accumulate electrons on the surface. So your capacitance, essentially, as you pointed out, is the capacitance of the oxide. What is the capacitance of the oxide? Let's say it has an oxide thickness of T ox. So let's say the thickness of this uh, insulator layer is called T ox. Right? And uh, whatever. So let's call it. Solid. Epsilon, epsilon mass. Right. So the capacitance per unit area of this thing, so this capacitance per unit area, would be at what? T ox, I'm sorry, uh, epsilon ox over T ox. So that's the capacitance per unit area. So if they are values of Vg, that's what you expect to see. And how do you measure this capacitance, by the way? How do you measure the capacitance? You can apply an AC voltage, a small voltage voltage, and monitor the AC current. Monitor the measure the impedance and from that capital to the capacity. Now, as you lower the voltage, so in this case, let's say your flat band happens here, at Vg equals zero, so we have the flat band condition. In general, this would be the flat band. So as you start lowering it, what, do you, what can you say about the capacity? Zero. Zero. Why would this go to zero? Think about it. Let's say you have formed a depletion region. What would the capacitance be? Would it be zero? So, so you have still a capacitor, right? You have a positive charge on the, the metal, or the, uh, the, induct the conductor, right? And you have negative charge on the bottom side that can change. So if you apply a variation to the voltage, the current can change, right? There will be a difference in the charge. The charge can change. You can store charge and you can take away charge. So you have a capacitor, but now this capacitor consists of two parts. One is the oxide capacitor, and the other one is the depletion capacitor. And actually, in your homework problem, I'm asking you to do some sort of the semi-obvious calculation to show that the effective capacitance is just like a series combination of these two capacitors. It's like two capacitors in series, right? You have the first capacitor and you have the second one. So, it, and so it's a smaller capacitor. So it's actually C ox in well. It's really series, but you know what? Well, let's call it C ox, C uh, depletion divided by C ox plus C depletion. So at some point, you go to that level. Right? That's when you have depletion. Now, what happens if you go to lower voltages? Hold on. 
charges like that picture up there at the surface, right? Like that, those or orange poles, right? So what you have, you have this. So you basically the two plates of your capacitors are now back to where they were on the two sides of the oxide, the insulator. So the capacitance goes back up to the same level for a slow sine wave. Now, what if I make this a very higher frequency, kind of increase the frequency of the sine wave that I measure, use to measure my capacitor? For a typical parallel plate capacitor, that should affect things a lot, right? For a standard capacitor. But now in this case, do you think that that's still the case? If I use a fast, higher frequency input. Well, it's interesting. If you start raising the frequency and if you go above several tens of kilohertz, what happens is that in the lab, you instead of seeing this, you see this. So this is for high frequency. This is for low frequency. Why does that happen? Mobility. Mobility. Of the host. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it, the mobility of holes is quite large, actually, still, if we compare to this. This is a much slower process. Right? There's a very slow process we just talked about. Is the generation the recombination. Where do these holes come from? Right? The holes that are generated can move relatively fast, quite fast actually. But they can't be generated fast enough, and they can't be re they can't recombine fast enough. So this generation recombination, which is responsible for having more or less holes, is slow. So it can't react fast enough, and therefore you just basically don't see any variation in the charge of the surface. The charge of the surface doesn't change that fast. So now, because of the charge neutrality, something else has something has got to give, right? If the surface charge is not changing because you don't have holes to make to move in and move out, right? What does happen? What will change? Now it's width of the diffusion region that will start changing. So the surface, the holes remain at the surface, but the width of the diffusion region changes when you move things fast because that's the only thing that can change. That, that's how you can get more charge at the surface to compensate the charge on top plate. And therefore, you are modulating the width of the depletion region, but therefore your capacitor, part of the capacitance that's really there is the depletion part. So you get basically again the same thing, the parallel combination of the oxide and the depletion capacitance. Right? Now, actually a third mode exists, which is very interesting. I kind of just as a side mode. If I Instead of applying a small sinusoid, sinusoidal input, just let's say I have a capacitor, let, let's say mass capacitor that's at standing in flat band voltage, let's say it's Vg equals zero. And I instantaneously apply a very large negative voltage to it, like a step, instead of a sine wave. From that also I can capture the capacitor because I can measure the current and then if you can, like, it's an it's a capacitor, then it's an integral, the charge, and all, and all that, right? Uh, I'm saying charge is the integral of the capacitor, and therefore there's an integral relation between the voltage and the capacitor and the uh, charge, right? Now, what happens if I apply a sudden step to the voltage, a sudden negative step? So I'm talking about something like this. So Vg is zero, up to seven point, and then boom, goes down to a large negative voltage. What do I expect from to see as a capacitor, as a value of the capacitor? What do you think will happen? Let's say, before talking about the capacitor, what happens in that picture? I don't have any charge here, so let me redraw the picture. It's happy sitting at constant uniform end, the electron density is constant, and all of a sudden I apply a negative voltage to this. Well, of course I accumulate a lot of negative charge on the surface, and I have to get some positive charge in the, in the bulk. Where does that come from? I have to form a depletion region. But now, I don't have time, I haven't given this time to generate the holes necessary to form a depletion region. Uh, the, the inversion layer, in this case, right? So I have the depletion, but I don't have enough, I haven't given enough time to form any or any significant number of holes at the surface. So to obtain charge from neutrality, the only thing that can happen is what? For the depletion region to get extended even beyond what 
where it would have been extended in the case where it had converged. So it goes farther out. And then, if you wait long enough, it, it gradually settles back to where it was, and then you will have some holes at the surface. Get back to that steady state. So in that case, what happens if you measure the capacitor like that, you see a diff even a, yet a smaller capacitor, which is basically C ox in, well, let's say in C is what I'll show you in this location, so you know what it means, of the new depletion capacitors. So this larger width of the depletion region, which corresponds to a smaller capacitor. So you see that this hole being available, or electrons being available, depending. I mean, I could make the opposite from kind of mass capacitor too. I could make it out of a p-type bulk. And everything I said would be valid except for changing the polarity. So I, if my accumulation would be formed by holes, and my inversion would be formed by electrons. But nonetheless, the same concept applies. And what I see is that it takes time to generate and dissipate these inversion, this inversion thing. Now, one more thing. If I were to define an onset, a threshold for when the inversion happens, well, how would you define it? When would you say the inversion occurs? Well, well when the yeah. ion crosses the yeah. Right. So, the, to have any kind of inversion, I have to have, as soon as these guys cross, the inversion has started to happen. But at that point, do I have a whole lot of inversion charge? No. When EI and EF are actually up on top of each other, what I have is an intrinsic piece of semiconductor. Right? So that's the intrinsic. So that's what we call the onset of weak inversion. What you just defined. That's, that's, that's a valid definition. It's the onset of weak inversion. But if I wanted to define something that was meaningful in terms of the conductivity, so let's say my, let's say my ball has a certain level, number of electrons. Right? So it has a certain density of electrons, let's say 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter electrons here, right? That would correspond to a certain number of charged carriers. What if I wanted to have exactly the same number of charged carriers, but of opposite side, of the opposite sign at the surface? If my constraint was to have the same number of holes, the, the same density of holes at the surface, that I had electrons in the bulk, what would that tell me about when that so-called strong inversion occurs, that's, that's what we call a strong inversion. When you have the same number of charge carriers on the opposite side, opposite type, at the surface. So what's the condition for that to happen in terms of EF and EI? Well, what determines an N and P? So, so I've done, we've done half of it, so let's write the other half. P is MI E to EI minus EF over KT. Right? So it's just a band's, um, it's equal in magnitude, but obviously it's order. Exactly. So this has to be equal to, it's a good thing of me, but the professor, you can change it. So these two have to be equal. Right? When those two are equal, what I have is a situation where the density of holes, in this case, at the surface, the inversion rate, is exactly the same as the density of electrons. And it's somewhat of an arbitrary definition, as you can see, but it's, it is some sort of definition. Because it also depends on, now it makes it dependent on the bulk. But that's a reasonable assumption, and we call that the strong inversion. That's when we can have a significant amount of charge carriers. And when we talk about the MOSFET, the transistor, we'll see that it is necessary to have a certain level of electron to, have to carry a substantial current. But now, the other interesting thing is that because of the fact that you still, even below this strong inversion layer, the weak inversion layer, you, you have certain charged carriers at the surface, right? So that's why, when you look at the MOS transistor, you have the so-called sub-threshold current. We define the threshold voltage for a MOS transistor, as we'll see probably next time, that the threshold voltage is defined by this band diagram, the way this voltage, the voltage at which, the threshold voltage is the voltage at which you have the same number of charge carriers of the opposite type of the surface compared to the ball. But now, you will see that even below that level, you have a certain number of charge carriers. So, that's why MOSFETs carry current 
below the threshold voltage because there are such charge carriers on the surface at that point. But this is the, on, this is the way we define the onset of the strong inversion. Now, at the onset of the strong inversion, can you tell me what the surface potential is? The potential here, the electric potential right here at the interface between the semiconductor and the insulator. What is it? Well, the surface potential is really, this is the zero potential, right? So this is the reference potential, this point. So here's reference. And then the surface potential is the potential here. So it's the, well, it's the difference here. I, I haven't, this doesn't track that. So it's the potential difference between here and there. What can you tell me about the potential difference at this onset of strong conversion? Let's call this, if I call this phi f, can you tell me what it is? 2 phi f. 2 phi f, right? So the surface potential is going to be 2 phi f. Now what is phi f? Phi f is this divided by q, right? q phi f, that's q phi f. Right? So that's simple to calculate. And what is N in the bulk? It's ND, right? It's determined by the density of the dopants. So N is ND at room temperature. So it's going to be ND over NI, um, natural law, and so on and so forth. Which we can actually, we, we've done this calculation before. It's right back to building potential. So you can actually redo it in terms of N, D, and N, I. And we've done it here. So basically it's N, D, and I. So you can invert that expression, right? So it's natural log of N, D over N, I times K, T over Q because you want to get psi, psi. So this is Pf. Right? So just solving that for Vs. And therefore Vs, the surface potential is going to be 2 Vs. Now, we have to solve this equation completely. What we need to do now is to calculate what is the voltage drop, the potential drop across the oxide, because I have an additional potential drop because there's a constant electric field inside across the oxide. So once I do that, I can calculate my Vg. So basically my Vg is going to be the sum of these two, the voltage drop across the oxide plus the surface potential, which is 2 Vf. And when I do that, I can actually determine the voltage at which the inversion, strong inversion occurs, and that's the threshold, the threshold for this mass capacitor when the strong inversion. And that's very important because once you reach that point, that's the basis for calculations leading to the equations for the MOSFET. If you want to form this inversion layer so it can carry charge speed, so it can carry current laterally, then you will have two terminals here and then the charge will flow laterally. And so what we'll do next time is to do this calculation. We'll go through this calculation actually and do it and calculate the electric field, put electric potential drop across this, and we know what the potential drop at the surface is. So the sum of these will be equal to this. And then we'll calculate the threshold. Once we calculate the threshold voltage, then we go back and look at those two assumptions we made. And you see that there will be some correction terms in the threshold voltage because of those two assumptions. We'll bring them back in. And then we say, well, this is the threshold voltage. Then we can come up with an expression for the charge at the surface in terms of that threshold voltage. And then we'll use that to create a MOSFET and then analyze it and come up with the equations, the IV characteristics of the MOSFET. And then we'll see some of the second order effects, like you know, high electric, high, uh, you know, high electric fields and high uh, fast carrier effects and things like that. Go check. Um, any questions? Uh, I'll see you next Wednesday. Don't forget to have your homework today.